You've written about the relationship between um, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook and and uh, what was that relationship, and how did uh, Rabbi Cook view Agno in you know in, in in terms of his place, possible place in Jewish literature and history? Oh, thank you for referencing that uh, that article I had written a number of years ago. It was published. You mentioned that I'm the editor of the journal Tradition. So our listeners can visit traditiononline.org. Uh, and in the archives, you can find that article uh, comparing, uh, discussing the relationship between Agnon and Rav Kook. R Rav Kook, you know, who I'm, I'm sure our listeners know was uh, this colossally important 20th century rabbinic figure. Uh, he becomes the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of the land of Israel before the establishment of the state. Uh, but at the time that Agnon arrives in Yafo in 1908, Rav Kook was the rabbi of the town. He had arrived a number of years prior, and he was the rabbi of, of Yafo, of Jaffa. Agnon was, you know, almost a full generation younger than, than Rav Kook. But Rav Kook, as part of his Zionist ethos, understood that Zionism wasn't, couldn't just be about bringing Jews to the land of Israel or back to the land of Israel. It wasn't just about building up the infrastructure of society here between these borders. And it wasn't even just about creating the physical facts on the ground that could one day lead to an autonomous Jewish state. It had to be part of a larger spiritual and cultural revival that part of being a nation means, yes, you have a state, and yes, you have control over your own affairs, but you also have your expansive culture. And through all the years of the diaspora, we didn't have that. We were culturally handicapped. Our cultural efforts, of course, were always maintained in that portable homeland in the text, in our books, in our Bate Midrash. And we poured a lot of our intellectual and spiritual creativity into developing a Torah literature. But a healthy nation has its own language, and a healthy nation is able to conduct its affairs in that language. And a healthy nation is able to be culturally creative in that, in that language. And while, of course, Rav Kook thought our first commitments were to Torah, he thought that part of the return was going to be this revival. And that's why, as opposed to kind of like the, the old guard that saw the modernization or the revival of Hebrew as a modern language, as a kind of, uh, as a kind of, um, of sacrilege, because you're taking the holy tongue and using it for the, for the car mechanic and the, and the pharmacy. That's what Yiddish is for. That's Yiddish is the language of everyday life. Uh, modern Zionism and modern religious Zionism saw the return to Hebrew as a great spiritual and cultural achievement. And Rav Cook says we need to have our own modern Hebrew, modern Jewish literature. Because if we revive Hebrew, in a way that we can translate Dostoevsky and Cervantes into Hebrew, which was done. That doesn't ipso facto make it Hebrew and certainly not Jewish literature. It's Russian or Spanish literature in translation and translation is wonderful. As I mentioned earlier, we all consume culture in translation, but translation allows you to be a tourist. Translation opens doors to other worlds and other cultures that you would not have access to without it. And like a tourist, you're able to experience that world, but you'll never be at home in it the way either a native or someone who makes their home in that other culture is. You'll always be a tourist. Now, there are tourists who know their way around. There are places you go to that you've never been to before, and you're really an outsider. And there are other places that you visit and you, you do feel at home in, but you're still a tourist. Rav Cook said in order to 
part of having a healthy culture is to develop our own modern Hebrew literature. And just like those other classic world authors I've, I've mentioned, develop their writing from within the sources of their culture, modern Hebrew literature is going to do that, drawing on, on our bookshelves. And young Agdon, his name wasn't even Agdon yet. He arrives in Jaffa in 1908. His name is Shmuel Yosef Chachkis. Chachkis was his birth name. Agdon is a pen name he takes uh, shortly after arriving. And Rav Cook quickly identifies this young Agnon as the type of author we need to accomplish this. Agnon, it's the story is told that, you know, Agnon had been writing stories and he'd begun publishing things and Rav Cook was very interested and Rav Cook asked to, to see some of his writing. Agnon's most important work written in that early period in, uh, in the land of Israel is a, a, a long novella. It was published first serially in the newspaper and then as a as a kind of standalone book. It was his first publication in, in book form, a work called Vihaya Akov Lamishor. In English, it was recently translated in our series as And the Crooked Shall Be Made Straight from Toby Press. And it's a, a kind of tragic tale of, uh, of a man and his wife back in, back in, uh, in Buchach, uh, in, uh, in Nagnon's hometown. It's set about a century prior to its uh, publication. And it's actually the story of an aguna and the birth of a mamzer, a woman who, whose husband disappears, not, not aguna in the contemporary sense of a man who refuses to give his wife again, but in the classic halachic sense, he disappears. And accidentally, or mistakenly, I should say, the rabbis allow her to remarry, uh, misunderstanding a piece of the evidence uh, which leads them to believe that he's dead. In fact, he's very much alive. And when he finally arrives, long delayed back in town, he discovers it's the eve of the Brit Mila of the son that was born to her from her second marriage. They had actually been childless uh, when, they were, when they were married. And what he does and the decisions he makes and the self-destruction involved. Well, this is not exactly the Mesilat Yisharim. Right? This is a story of the birth of a mamzer. Of course, no one in town knows this. Only this tragic fellow who takes the secret with him to his grave and we, the readers, but everyone else in town are unaware that this child that was born is a mamzer, a a halachic a bastard, un, unable, if anyone were to know, to marry into the mainstream Jewish community because he was born out of wedlock. She was legally married, halachically married to this fellow uh, who was mistakenly presumed dead. So Agnon was a little skeptical about showing this work to, uh, to Rav Cook. It's a little scandalous. I mean, by our standards today, it's, it's not even rated PG, it's rated G. But the standards, you understand, the standards have been lowered, uh, uh, you know, in, in the last century plus. Uh, but because of its kind of uh, sensitive uh, halachic nature, he's skeptical about showing it to Rav Kook. Ultimately, he does. Rav Kook reads it before it's published, when it's still in manuscript. And he hands it back to Agnon. And according to Agnon's report, Rav Kook said to him, Zehu sipur ivri be'emet. This is an authentic, the word Ivri at this point in history is tricky. Ivri means both Jewish, but it also means Hebrew, meaning in the Hebrew language, meaning it means both. This is an authentic Hebrew Jewish story. Hanoveya min hatsinarot lelo shum mechitza, which flows through the divine channels with no barrier. Now, whatever that Kabbalistic metaphor means is, is not important. But what Rav Cook was saying, or it's not important for us right now, but what Rav Cook was saying was that this is exactly the type of work that the new Jewish society in the land of Israel needs. It is not the guide for the perplexed. It is not a Musser Sefer, although we can learn a lot from modern literature. It's a tragic modern tale. But it's one which emanates culturally from the wellsprings of, of Judaism. That's what modern literature 
does. And uh, I think that story encapsulates something of why Ruff Cook saw something positive in Agnon's, in Agnon's writing. Agnon maintained a lifelong, of course, Ruff Cook passed away in 1935. Uh, Agnon lived until 1970, but Agnon maintained a lifelong uh, reverence for, uh, for Ruff Cook. And uh, those of you that will come to visit us here in the Beit Agnon on your next uh, visit to Jerusalem, you can hear some of the many anecdotes that, uh, that get passed around about their about their relationship and about the time that Rav Cook came to visit here and other such things.